All right, thank you very much. I understand I've got the last slot before lunch, and uh, so I take that responsibility very seriously, and we'll try to get through this as quickly as we can. So, um, uh, just a few quick words about uh, what we do in Ensemble. So, I'm the general manager of a pure software business unit, um, and we do nothing but network function virtualization software, and our focus is at the edge. So, hence the uh, title of this speech is really Postcards from the Edge. We're not dealing with core IMS type NFV, we're really dealing with UCPE and other propositions that you put down at premises. How do we make that, uh, how do we make that model come, come to pass? Okay, so just a, a quick trip back. Um, this is a wonderful place to, to look at all this. NFV, what was the original idea when the Etsy crowd um, at this conference dropped um, their original idea? Um, it was around delayering, just as we had all seen when we were quite a bit younger, the PC industry transformed how office equipment was produced and manufactured, so too we believe that uh, the telecommunications, the packet services industry would be transformed by delayering a hardware provider, a software layer, then individual applications on top. And two major goals that we thought we'd get out of that. First is freedom from lock-in, so a single vendor wouldn't be able to kind of give us a multi-layer stack and lock us in. Second, we would have a platform that we could reuse and start to lay out new applications on, um, things that we hadn't even thought of uh, when we began. And finally, we actually said we thought we'd save a bunch of money because it's the reason I'm not shipping all this metal to the customer premises instead of a stack of one RU boxes. They're just going to have a server with a bunch of software on it. There's got to be a big savings in there. And as it happened uh, in the industry, it didn't quite pan out that way, at least not to start. Um, the the PNF vendors, when they started introducing their virtual network functions, their VNFs, they kept pricing quite conservatively high. And a couple reasons for that, they weren't sure about the new market, and they also wanted to protect their top line revenue numbers. So we started changing our story. And uh, there was all kinds of news articles about this over the past year, 18 months, that really the CapEx story was an eventual, um, but the, the real win in the short term was service agility. If you map forward to now, the truth is people started looking at service agility, and yes, as long as you're in some kind of a silo, uh, you can run service agility fairly quickly, I can roll out new services. But if I'm really trying to tie it into the full uh, service provider backend network, I've got to deal with automation and transformation, all those things that we've heard uh, quite a few speakers talk about this morning and yesterday. So that's a bit of a battle, but the good news is CapEx is actually getting there. So the function providers are now starting to lower their prices to the point where a UCPE stack, if you will, from a dollar perspective, makes sense. It is possible now to roll out these services in an economic way, and that's really only happened, I would say, across the industry in the last six months, six to nine months. So that's what's happening at the um, market side. What's been happening at the technology side? So the first thing that happened is as the, um, use, or as the edge NFV market started to develop, um, the first players who were on it were, not surprisingly, the IP vendors. Why? Because the people offering those services were the IP service people within the service providers. They weren't the transport guys, they were the IP guys. And they went and talked to their traditional vendors, and their traditional vendors did the obvious thing, which is to take their traditional products, slap an x86 board into it, um, and say, right, you can run some VNFs there alongside of the magic that we always do. So it'll be a box with our FPGA or ASIC, our software, and some x86, and we'll somehow make the whole thing work. A lot of customers, end customers, looked at that and said, gee, what's the point? I'm still locked in, it's still kind of the same thing, and it's really just a technology substitution for that initial vendor. Then the next thing that happened was SD-WAN. So anybody who was involved as we are at the edge felt that wave. I mean, it just dominated the 2016 cycle. And pretty much anybody that you had been talking to who had the competence and interest to look into edge NFV suddenly got yanked and said, we have to go and look at SD-WAN and we have to roll something out now because we're losing customers. Um, and very few of them were in a position to roll out SD-WAN on a, any sort of a UCPE proposition on NFV. So they just rolled out an appliance. And they did so reluctantly because they said, it's 2016, it's the last thing I want to do is roll out another appliance, but I got to get something out. 
So that happened. And from the SD-WAN vendor perspective, it was a double-edged sword. Most of them had sold themselves to their VC investors as a pure software play. So they didn't really strategically want to get involved in shipping boxes, but they couldn't help but notice how sticky their relationship was with their customers once they had done so. So they had wins and losses on that equation. Now what seems to be happening is there are a lot of vendors now who are freeing themselves of their hardware but they're still trying to play at more than one layer. So they're saying, yeah, well, we do a bunch of applications and you can extend and we can host somebody else um, at our layer, or sorry, at a, as another VNF onto our platform, a software platform. So that's interesting, um, but y y it puts the service provider now in the position of trying to force the hosting layer provider to host one of his or her competitors at the same level. And it gets sticky and people fight and all the usual things. So that's sort of the, sort of the evolution of the market, if you will, at the edge. This is really not what we had in mind when we began, which is what a nicely layered stack hardware provider and a VI at the software layer and then applications on top. So now, um, this is what we're seeing. And uh, you, I think you heard, uh, hopefully if you were here yesterday, the uh, Verizon uh, presentation, which was really quite eloquent about this, is the market is speaking clearly that they want white box. So uh, anybody who's tried to ask their IT department to loosen a rule for their benefit will find out that, yeah, the, the IT departments have, have opinions. <laughs> um, and the CIOs are strongly opinionated that they want white box because it is their proof that they're not getting locked in by the service provider. I want to see you at the logical extreme to run your services on my hardware. So bring your own hardware. When that happens, the NFEI software layer, or network OS, becomes the critical convergence layer. So if I've got N hardware vendors and M uh, application vendors on top, the pairwise integration of all those things together is not a practical problem for any service provider to do. They need a layer of commonality. And so we believe that the NFEI software layer is the one that is going to act as that, that commonality layer. So as we say, NFV without the layer violations. So what's in this, this network OS, in this NFVI software? There's a whole bunch of, of alphabet soup, the usual stuff around networking protocols, both in terms of tying into the underlay network, whatever it happens to be, layer two, layer three, MPLS, uh, and providing the overlay service. The wins that I want to call out are in the top row. Two things. First of all is uh, forwarding performance you need to be able to offer services in software where you've got packet forwarding from as little as 10 megabits up to, let's say, 40 gig. You need an architecture that allows you to do that and to do so in a way that is SLA worthy in terms of throughput, latency, and jitter. That is a hard problem, and I'll be honest, it is not a something that OVS, which we all love, can do. Um, the, the requirements to do these SLA worthy throughput and jitter performance numbers um, have not gone away. They've been the basis of every SLA that's been written for the past couple of decades. Um, they're still there. So you need software that can do that. The other thing that you need right in the base layer is encryption. This is becoming uh, absolutely table stake, be it layer three encryption, IPsec, or more commonly now layer two encryption, which is what is needed um, ultimately to support cloud access. Um, these things are really common services that belong down in this layer. So that's the, if you will, the data plane side of the network OS. There's also the hosting side. So just two statements to make here. The first is um, uh, political, and the second is, uh, is technical. The political statement is the comment I made earlier about no layer violations. You want your hosting layer to be non-competitive with your applications. You don't want to, as a service provider, have to be managing fights between the, the vendors at different layers in your solution stack. So it's important that this be uh, from a neutral vendor. The second thing is, um, how do I run it? So it's only two years ago, I think, that Peter Willis was here um, saying there are all these flaws with OpenStack. How on earth are we ever going to uh, run a, a wide area network with thousands upon thousands of nodes into OpenStack controllers? And as, as it happens, we, or our predecessor company, Overture, were working with Peter at the time. And the counterintuitive solution that we came up with was to actually take the OpenStack controller and actually push it down into the CPE. 
And this is surprising, but it has some wonderful properties. It solves a whole bunch of security problems. You don't have to be poking a bunch of holes in the firewall um, back at the service provider side. You have manageable scaling, and you have, facing the orchestrator, a consistent Vim API interface to be used at all times. So that's, if you will, the structural side of the, what the network OS has to do. The other thing that it does in practice is that it is the thing that marries all these wonderful data center technologies with the realities of deploying as CPE. And CPE is a weird place. You can't afford to go and touch these nodes. They have to be bulletproof, um, and they have to be um, very small footprint. And they also not, have to require not a lot of fiddling. I can't roll a truck out to deal with these things on a regular basis the same way that I could have somebody walk down the aisle of my data center because if I have to roll a truck, I've destroyed all the savings that I was supposed to get from UCP in the first place. So two operational values that I'd like to, to talk about. The first is zero touch. So um, we have, with, with our uh, customers, been working on a model, and it's actually based upon IETF standards, uh, for zero touch. And it's, it's an extraordinary model, and it's really transformative in terms of the economics of rolling out a CPE-based service. The first step is that we, as the software provider, provide a, a customer-specific version of the image, which includes just a few defaults for the operator. There are certificates, and they're call home servers, so callhome.serviceprovider.com. That's packaged onto a golden image and delivered to the hardware vendor. The hardware vendor, whomever they may be, they deploy that onto the physical device, and then they drop ship that to the end customer. Next, at some point, roughly in parallel with this, a site survey has to happen, right? The, the, the end customer has to say, this is the service that I'd actually like, these are the parameters, the bandwidth, et cetera, et cetera, and that is collected by the service provider. It's stored up into the mano layer as configuration, and in return, a, a secret is sent down. And the role of the secret is key, because it serves as the second factor for authentication. The next thing that happens is the drop shipped piece of CPE arrives um, at the customer prem. The customer, not the service provider, the customer actually plugs it in and applies internet. It finds its way home, um, and it delivers the secret, which the customer has entered by email uh, as a second factor, uh, up to the mano layer. The mano layer then authenticates it, it kicks the orchestrator, it kicks the zero-touch provisioning machinery, and that drives all of the VNFs down, uh, as well as any initial provisioning that's required. This is spectacular. What have, what have we achieved here now for the service provider? A bunch of things. First of all, the CFO is going to love the fact that he never had inventory. He or she never had inventory. Operations people love they've never had a truck roll. These are massive contributors to the overall cost of running a CPE service, and they're now gone. And most interestingly, there's no time to revenue. So if it is not the case that a, a service is being pulled for the first time, I can be running this over LTE, I can run it over direct internet access, and actually start to provide the service day one, even if there is ultimately some sort of private circuit to be attached to this, to this service in the end. The other thing, as, as I mentioned, in terms of operational values, is what we call bring your own hardware. So as I mentioned, the end customers, the CIOs, are opinionated, and they really do want to see that I can run this on the hardware of my choosing. I have a purchasing relationship with Dell or HPE or whomever it is. I want you to run your service on my hardware, and if I want to kick you out, I kick you out, and then I can redeploy that piece of hardware to some other purpose within my operation. It is only a very small variation uh, on the flow that we just went through for zero-touch provisioning that instead of applying a golden image to the hardware then drop shipping that, you deliver a vanilla image uh, as software to the, to the enterprise. They apply that to the hardware. It sniffs, finds out what it's got down there, um, and then it reboots itself with the proper configuration to be running now um, uh, on that target hardware. So this is very exciting. The end customers uh, of our customers uh, are very keen on it, and it's um, uh, something that I think ultimately delivers the real promise of Edge NFV that, w that came uh, in the presentation five years ago. Okay, so that's a lot of hard work. Um, great, what's the payback? Um, so I just want to leave you with sort of three thoughts in terms of the payback. The first is the one that was originally advertised, which is choice. 
So operators um, now literally can run all uh, run a variety of original equipment manufacturers through their shop. We're dealing with ones who, who began their service offerings on vendors A and B, and then they're running an RFI to introduce vendors C and D, and ultimately they will go to bring your own hardware. This is real, it happens in the field all the time now. As I said, we sit there as a convergence layer to uh, manage the um, the end by M combinatorial explosion. But the other choice that got delivered was uh, application choice. So I've got choice in two dimensions. The first is on a per function basis now, I have the choice of which vendors do I want to offer. And this again is real. Customer Bazaars in the field will offer, a, uh, say for a firewall, any one of the vendors listed. Mr. S Mr. and Ms. CIO, what is your preferred firewall? Okay, no problem, that's here on the shelf, you can take it. And we know it's been pre-proven to work in this lineup. Um, and then the other dimension is additional applications. So the choice argument, the one that we were promised by the NFE guys, actually is true. But there's more. So they also promised us that I've got an open platform, and on this open platform, I can start to run applications that I hadn't even thought of when I began to roll this thing out. So I just want to run two in front of you. Um, the first relates to cloud connectivity. So I think, as everybody knows, the cloud guys are kind of big. They've got armies of people whose job it is, nine to five every day, to run out and knock on the door of an enterprise and say, dear Mr. and Ms. CIO, I would like you please to take some of your loads and run them up in my public cloud, and I will create a virtual pri private cloud for you. Very common. But they are very poorly served by the encryption options um, that they have to encrypt that traffic from the enterprise up to the cloud. There's very expensive IPsec-based uh, gateways that are used, and all of them require some form of a hardware solution, which is a problem when you're in a cloud provider who's whose reason to be is that I run racks and racks and racks of identical thing and achieve, achieve tremendous economies of scale. What we're able to do here is to offer a cloud access encryption service. This is natively part of the network OS. And because it's entirely virtual, it can run hosted in whatever the environment is back up at the cloud side. So you have a cloud access solution as a bonus uh, on this, and this is uh, a, a very, obviously very big, the cloud, the cloud market is huge, but the encryption market is tremendously high priced. Um, it's been very nicely protected little market, not like the ones that we all make our living in. Uh, and so there's ample opportunity to delight the customer and reduce their costs. The last one I want to talk about is also something that certainly wasn't thought of in the days of the original um, Etsy paper and that is something called Enterprise LTE. So there are two big things going on. The, the core NFV people have been working very hard on virtualizing um, the EPC. Great. Um, in parallel, um, cloud RAN activity has been going on and virtual RAN is possible. Aside from that, in the standard space, um, people have been working, 3GPP has been working on defining the use of LTE over unlicensed spectrum, so Wi-Fi spectrum in effect, as well as uh, what's called loosely licensed spectrum, which is CBRS, which you can effectively have a license pretty much yours for the asking. The net result of all these factors is it is now possible for an enterprise to run their own LTE network. So let's dig in, find out how they would do that and what the motivations would be. So how they would do that is fairly straightforward. I can take the virtual EPC software that has come out of that whole core evolution topic, as well as the virtual BBU software that's come out of the VRAN efforts, and run them side by side with all the other apps that I was talking about with UCPE on the same platform as a bonus. So what's the motivation? Why would anybody care? Um, from the business perspective, from the enterprise perspective, it's a home run. So instead of buying tens of thousands of minutes of airtime uh, on a monthly package or millions of minutes, whatever the size of my business is, um, I can reduce that dramatically because now whenever my employees are within my four walls, they're actually getting their services natively over an LTE network that I provide. So then you might think, well, okay, I get it from the enterprise perspective, but why on earth would the mobile operator be interested in such a thing since it's gonna reduce his monthly recurring revenue? Two reasons for that. First of all, they can now start to offer service over free spectrum, right? 
You think of the enormous numbers that we always see at these auctions for what these guys have to pay for Spectrum, and now they can do it for free. Secondly, if I'm not the incumbent mobile operator, I can use this to go in and attack and say, I'm going to get that enterprise away from their current vendor. Um, so it is strongly motivated for the enterprise, uh, for the, sorry, for the mobile network operator. And as I said before, same platform. So two quick thoughts to leave you with, right? The round one is over, right? The operators believe, they've done the numbers, they understand what this is going, and the gray box solutions that they began with, honestly, are a net negative in the marketplace. They're getting a lot of resistance, as you heard um, in earlier presentations. Now round two is underway. Um, the application choice has been delivered. The ability to run extra unthought of applications has, uh, has been brought to the market, and we're starting to get the payback for all this hard work that we've been doing. So that is the update from The Edge. Um, thank you very much for your attention and hope you enjoy lunch. Thank you.